Hi, welcome to Ask the Manager. We're doing something different today. We're at Town Hall in the Selectman's room, and the room is empty. It's just the three of us, and our guest is Michael Perna. Now, many of you know Michael Perna, and for many different reasons, but Michael is our town historian, so if there's anything you want to know, Michael knows about it, and he probably has a picture of it, too. Um, he is a retired, I have to read this, he's retired senior master sergeant of the Air National Guard, and he's chief of military records for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and he's our veterans agent, and he's past president of our historical society. So he certainly likes history. Did you like history in school, Michael? I did. We'll see. Not many of the other subjects. Not many of the other subjects, but definitely history, right. huh? <laughs> Especially U.S. history, evidently? Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll start with letting Michael ask the first question. Well, let's see. A number of years ago, as I mentioned earlier, I was on the show, mm -hmm. there, were, there were some questions that came up, and I've noticed that uh, some of these are still valid questions. They haven't uh, been changed or anything like mm -hmm. that. And Although there is one new one. I'll address that one first. Um, lately in town, we've uh, had occasion to have an Airbnb open. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been asking about it. A lot of people aren't really happy. Mm -hmm. uh, what the guidelines are? Are there guidelines mm -hmm. uh, for something like that? Yep. So there's a lot of traffic in and out. And yeah. So we haven't done. So we uh, haven't done any local regulations since the onset of the um, you know short-term rentals, Airbnb has come into play. We do have a lodging house, which, you know, or a short term, you know, which is similar to short term rentals, but we haven't put any uh, zoning in place on purpose so far. We're trying to see how it plays out. There was a state law that passed that um, comes into effect this July 1st that requires anyone who uh, rents uh, short term rentals out um, on uh, a certain frequency or so many times over the course of the year that they have to register those with the state. Um, mo interestingly enough, we've talked to both neighbors who obviously share in what I think are pretty common concerns about not really knowing who's next door, um, the number of, um, you know, the traffic and things like that. And we've also talked to some of the owners of properties and, and proprietors of these types of establishments. And I, I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised to hear that the folks that are uh, renting some of the homes out in the community um, are very interested in uh, registering them and complying with the law and paying the use and occupancy tax. The town will benefit from that. Um, but um, so I, I do realize it's concerning within some communities in the, you know, the pure residential uh, sense, but we've also heard from people who um, have some unique spaces like right along Route 9 who actually are able to fill spots that they had trouble with in the past because folks in the hospital are now using those, you know, Airbnb to try to, you know, stay at a more reasonably priced place if they can't get a hotel room or something like that. So um, we certainly share in the, the residents' concerns of a, you know, more transient nature of a neighborhood and it's not really what they bought into. Um, so we're going to look at that over probably the next... I don't know if it'll take a full year, but uh, we've purposely not acted yet until we can kind of, I think, better gauge uh, how many are actually operating in the town once they have to register with the, with the state, and should we take any action, um, you know, at that time. So those are our, that's our thoughts so far. So why would people want to come to Shrewsbury other than if they were connected to a patient at UMass? What would bring people to Shrewsbury in an Airbnb? Well, I know some houses along Lake Quinsigamon, okay. um, you know, are rented for those purposes. And um, other than that, I think that um, the utilization of short-term rentals is more common than maybe you or I would expect. Um, some, some people, you know, would rent them for a month or so if they're just in visiting family. Um, you know, other things like that. So I've, I've heard some pretty interesting stories about, you know, why people go on there, why they rent, rent homes like that. 
That's interesting. Yep. And how did you come to know about Airbnbs? Do you have them in your neighborhood? There's one, uh -huh. and some of the neighbors are not thrilled, let's say. Um, a lot of small children, mm -hmm. very close proximity, and they get a little nervous because uh, there's so much turnover. Sure. I know that what sticks in my mind, I know people use them, but in uh, Framingham, there was a big issue in one neighborhood because it was rented out to college students and they would have parties there. Mm -hmm. And so that was very upsetting to the neighbors and they had problems mm -hmm. as a result of that. Um, but most people renting an Airbnb are just renting for you know personal reasons, right. not necessarily to have a party. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't imagine that it must be very concerning because you don't know who's in the house next door in that situation, so you, mm -hmm. the board has their work cut out for them once mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Can't keep up with the changing no, times. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of the challenges. There are a number of small stone bridges in town mm -hmm. that were built probably by the WPA in the 30s okay. during the Depression, stuff like that. It was one on Oak Street. I think the one on South Quinsig may have been replaced. I'm not sure. I think there's one on up by Clue Street. Uh, one out towards, uh, if you go out uh, Prospect Street and then okay. down whatever Reservoir Reservoir Street. I think there's one down there. Okay. But those those bridges are getting pretty old. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on replacing them? Some say Oak Street gets a ton of traffic yeah. over it every day. Um, that's interesting that you asked that. Um, whenever there's a, a bridge that's that size, um, you know we we do do regular inspections and review those bridges. It falls below the mass DOT threshold where they inspect it, but you know, it's considered, um, you know, if it's a, under a certain span, it's more of a culvert than a bridge. But I mean, I'm, I can't say, Mike, that I'm 100% familiar with the particular bridges that you are talking about, but it is something, you know, across the town that is on our radar that, that we do regular and, and frequent inspections for. I'd actually be interested to see those, those structures, you know, given their age. Um, probably just as well built or better well built or better okay. built than most of, you know, our modern day things. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that um, probably many residents drive over and never even realize that's, they're crossing right. over yeah. some type of structure. But I know the highway department and um, DPW and engineering do have that extensive list. Um, there was a state grant program that came into play, I think, about four years ago now called the Small Bridge Program. Uh, where the state was actually incentivizing communities to do uh, replacements of these um, smaller bridges which fall under their threshold. Again, once it reaches a span of over 20 feet, then it's a, they're all state-owned structures. So, um, but uh, I'll certainly look into those particular structures and, and, and uh, see where they fall on our, um, on our list for replacement. Okay, so I want to cut in and ask a question. Uh, because there was supposedly the threat of snow this past week in town, um, and fortunately it stayed away from our town, uh, how did you end up with um, dollar-wise mm -hmm. for the snow and ice budget? Yeah, we, we actually did pretty good. It was, a, you know, we didn't have a lot of major snow events, but as you know we don't need a you know a major snow event to spend a lot of money some of those nuisance storms cost us just as much uh, and certainly more on a per inch basis than than a large storm does um, we ended up I uh, spending you know more than 80 percent of the budget I don't know what the final figure is but the uh, reason that we actually it was actually that much is because again we built the new salt shed this year so we started the winter with literally no salt on hand and now I've tripled the capacity to be able to store it so um, you know salt price trends over the past few years have continued to, to go up so we took a good look at that um, and actually filled um, the structure up not completely to its capacity, but we have a lot on hand, which puts us in a really good position for next year, especially as prices go up. So um, our salt expenditures, 
uh, were higher than average, but our utilization, you know, was about average or a little bit less. So um, the numbers are a little deceptive this year because of that. The new but we shed. still came on in under yeah, budget. Yeah, in under budget, no no issues, no transfers required for it. So we're in a good spot. Now, over the last few years, mm -hmm. um, it's changed the trend from. Um, always going over the snow budget mm -hmm. because it was always under budgeted. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that we're better off planning ahead and being above and, yeah. and coming in under as opposed to, you know, over budgeting? Yeah. Yeah. I think that we're, pr we're pretty, we're, we're not well over budgeted, but we're in a really good spot. Even if we have a bad winter where we're not going to need to draw upon other reserves. Um, a lot of that trend is not only because we increase the amount of money that goes in there, but we just use a lot less material. Um, you know, we hardly use any sand, literally a couple of tons of sand. You know, that, that saves us money on our, our street sweeping costs in the spring. And with stormwater regulations come into play, that's a, that's a huge deal for us. And then the level of sophistication um, on our salt spreaders you know, we can calibrate them at very fine levels electronically now, and they actually all have GPS systems on it, so we know how much salt we're spreading at what rate in one sec what section of the community. So um, we're just a lot more efficient because of that technology, and it's really been paying off um, a lot, uh, you know, a lot less excess uh, and a, a lot more effective use of the resources. Oh. Yeah. Around town there are still uh, a number of dirt roads. Yeah. Even though they're public ways, they plow them and everything. Mm -hmm. um, some people ask, why aren't they being paved? Mm -hmm. They're not very long. Uh, they've been there for a long, long time. It's, right. it's kind of a, a headache to drive over them. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they are... I can't say it with 100% authority, but I want to say every... Uh, unpaved street in town is a private way, uh, but we perform winter snow and ice operations. Uh, okay. So those, that's the only exemption in Chapter 90 where we're allowed to perform public services on private property, uh, snow and ice operations for um, private ways. And those are private ways of a certain age that, um, you know, kind of preceded the Chapter 90 law and that formula and, and designation of, of some aspects of public streets. Um, there is a process for residents that live on private ways to have them um, become public ways, but the problem is in some instances, as you mentioned, they're r rather short or um, just the opposite. They may be much longer and only have a few residents that live on there. Um, and Residents are required to bring them up to current town standards and then turn them over. Um, and normally that's not done by residents actually improving the road themselves, but they commit to fund that over a certain period of time through a betterment. So if you have a, a relatively short street with you know, a large number of houses on it, if you get everyone to sign off and petition the town, and you know, then that way can be accepted and it would be accepted at town meeting because we'd have the guarantee that all the improvements um, would be made to it and brought up to, to public street standards. And there have even been a few uh, that we did last year um, that we brought into uh, public way status and made the improvements on. But there is a process, and it starts off with a general petition, uh, first-round petition from the, from the residents that live there. But then ultimately everyone has to sign off on the price. Uh, and there can't be anyone that, that disagrees. So that's how you would make that street public. I think... Um, Full disclosure: I live on a private way in Sturbridge, Whoa. so it sounds it sounds very nice and exclusive. But yeah, you lose a lot of benefits of of the common maintenance and things like that. Um, there there may be some advantages, but I would argue, uh, especially from living on one, that with public utilities running down them, you know, a high number of you know residences on a street that maybe used to be desolate that seemed really private. There's, you know, it's really kind of a disadvantage to, to live on it because you, you don't. And, I, you know, I, I have talked to a lot of residents even here, and, and they say they're frustrated because, you know, quote, they pay the same taxes as everyone else but don't get the same services. And that's true, but, you know, whether right, wrong, or indifferent, when you're signing that deed to that property, it's clearly stated that it's a private way and, you know, 
kind of let the buyer be wary. You have to understand what it is that you're doing um, at that time. So There was a time where it seemed every year we would approve streets mm -hmm. and make roads public. Mm -hmm. And then we got to a point, time flies, so I've lost track of when it was, um, but in the last 20 years, I'm going to say to play it safe, mm -hmm. uh, people started to uh, oppose it. Mm -hmm. if, if one person opposed it, then they'd take the town to court, mm -hmm. and it becomes uh, quite a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, we slowed down. The town slowed down on um, having roads improved mm -hmm. unless there was full agreement because mm -hmm. um, it, it became a legal issue for the town mm -hmm. and became an expense for the town. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there was a while where it seemed like we always had roads that were being made public. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, the only ones being made public now are the ones that are um, contracted turning the street over yeah. to the town. And it, it does get frustrating at some points in the winter um, for the residents and even for the town, because if condition if conditions deteriorate such that it's we're damaging equipment when we're plowing the roadway, we actually have to stop plowing it because we don't want to damage equipment again on that private property under um, those snow and ice conditions. So you know we we talk with a lot of residents about that, and it's it's frustrating for them and it's frustrating for the town. We we always will do what we have to do to respond in public safety situations to get you know a, a fire truck or an ambulance down there um, but because of the potential damage that we can do to our equipment or contracted equipment there are some points in time throughout the course of the year where we actually have to send letters out and stop and at that point residents are required to uh, bring the roadway conditions back to a sufficient grading not pave or anything like that but get it graded fill in the potholes and then we'll resume those operations. and that's expensive yeah, it is. It can be. It's a you know an unexpected or an unplanned cost yep. for the people that live on that street. Yep. Uh, and and people have an assessment according to their frontage. Is that how that works? If you're going to have your uh, roadway paved, right. yep, it'd be divided up equally based upon the amount of frontage that you have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and in some instances where you know there's a corner lot or you know some other uh, you know someone owns both sides of the streets, you know that's where you get the one resident. You know, who, you know, although it's fair based on linear foot of frontage, it's an undue burden, you know, when you're trying to get them to buy in and make that decision. Right. Now, Colonial Drive, how's that intersection construction? That's all done or? No, so uh, um, the actual improvement uh, changes at the Colonial Drive intersection um, are tied to the DOT uh, bridge, the bridge reconstruction project, and it's at the, at the, it's at the latter end of that project, so those improvements wouldn't actually be made until uh, the spring of 2021. So the work that's going on there right now is um, that the um, southbound side of the bridge will be deconstructed over the summer. All traffic in two lanes will be on the north side, north, current northbound lanes. People pulling out of that Wachusett Long Fellow, fellow area mm -hmm. and the Barnard Road area on both sides comment very often that it's difficult to pull out in traffic because the cars are coming so fast over the bridge mm -hmm. that it's difficult for them to pull out. Will mm -hmm. that ever be addressed in this project? So there's some things that we are doing to, um, or MassDOT actually, it's their project, is doing to um, slow traffic down First and foremost, the off ramps are going to be reconfigured um, through paving and striping, and they're going to be sharper, so you're going to have to slow down. Uh, so especially if you're coming off of, you know, 290 um, eastbound and you're going to go south on 140, and it is very close to Wachusett, you're going to be forced to slow down more. And then the other major change is that the the traffic on the bridge is only going to be one lane in each direction. So in some instances, that should slow traffic because there will be a higher volume of traffic, and the roadway width will seem much more narrow. And um, it's, it's pretty well known if you look at traffic situations. If you're on a roadway like, you know, Route 140, um, you know, down in the area of um, uh, Gulf Street, or something like that, where the road's really wide, or Gold Street, sorry, where it's oh, where it's okay. really wide, then traffic 
speeds increase because people feel very right. comfortable. But as you narrow even just the, the, the uh, striping on a roadway, people tend to slow down. It's kind of a comfort thing. Do you think people slow down through neighborhoods because the streets are smaller? <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the thought. There's a lot of traffic calming measures that you can do with physical objects and trees and stuff like that, but um, it's hard to tell what folks will do. Yeah, <laughs> and most of the speed in neighborhoods seem to be the neighbors themselves. Yeah. So it's not mm -hmm. the stranger coming into your neighborhood, it's the neighbors mm -hmm. themselves that pick up speed. The property that the town owns where the police boathouse is, mm -hmm. there's been discussion over the years, why aren't we utilizing that for some type of little park or mm -hmm. a small beach? Mm -hmm. um, you could still maintain the boathouse property with some fencing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or in some cases people said, uh, why, don't, why doesn't the town even sell it? Mm -hmm. you know, beachfront property, it's not being used for anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I honestly, Mike, haven't, you know, had any conversations about changing that over. Um, we still utilize the boathouse, and and um, this year, thankfully, we're going to have greater support and assistance from the city of Worcester. You know, the most common thing that I've heard about Lake Quinn Sigamon is we need more police patrols out there, especially on really busy weekends. And, you know, we need multiple officers out there because dealing um, – with individuals on the water on a boat from you know being a, the, a one officer just isn't ideal. So uh, we have had great conversations with the city of Worcester, who's going to deploy their public safety boat a lot more this summer, kind of to complement our evening patrols um, and the environmental police. But it, it's interesting. I you know I I've never I haven't thought about you know the concept of selling it or, or changing it any other way. I think the Donahue Rowing Center in and of itself we also can look at to probably use better uh, as an asset, uh, you know, to make sure that that wonderful resource that's been given to the town is, you know, fully utilized. So we do have some, you know, some meetings down there. It's obviously very busy this time of the year with um, um, crew activities and things like that. Um, but I hadn't really thought about the, the boathouse. You know, near the boathouse, um, it would be nice even if you could make it, where it may not be a swimming spot where the town's responsible for the swimming, but it's a place where people could go and sit on park benches mm -hmm. and just enjoy the scenery because same it is a nice Jordan location. Yeah. yeah, same, yes, same with Jordan Pond uh, because uh, the lake is beautiful and we take it for granted, but usually we don't have an opportunity mm -hmm. to find a spot where you can stop mm -hmm. because we can't, unless it's off season, you can't pull up to the boat ramp and just pull in and en enjoy it, right. even though it's a public area, unless you want to pay, even though you don't have a boat, I don't think you can just go in and park, mm -hmm. right? I'm not sure, to be yeah. honest with you. I think you can. I'm not sure either. But, mm. and, and I think that the Donahue Rowing Center, the, um, the building where you can have a party, is a really nice it is. spot. And the only reason I know that I didn't use it for various organizations is because the price didn't, seem practical mm. um, it, it's it's more expensive to use it and there were a lot of obstacles I think it, it would be used very often if um, that could be streamlined and more user-friendly mm -hmm. and that the price was more reasonable or competitive with the other mm -hmm. options people have I because I, I believe that that's totally underutilized mm -hmm. And it's a, it's agree. really beautiful if you, mm -hmm. can, if you can never get down there. Yep. I yep. was I was there once for um, we had fireworks for some reason I can't even remember. Mm -hmm. I think the bridge was opening or something, and we just stopped there to see the fireworks, and it was an awesome spot. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you can only go there off season, mm -hmm. so there really isn't a public spot along the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's people we know along the lake, but I don't know that the Politos would like all of us dropping in. <laughs> um, so, I mean. Has there ever been any thought given, uh, as you may know, uh, some of the surrounding towns, Holden, West Boylston, have town-owned pools. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Shrewsbury, we have the lake, but we mm -hmm. don't have a public pool. Uh, place to go swimming. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been any thought of 
something like that. I honestly haven't seen anything in the in the documents that I've gone through or been able to review. Um, you know, I know it is a it is a, a common question, uh, splash pads and splash parks and things like that. I honestly haven't seen anything here. I keep hearing about the dog park interest, but but never um, really um, any pool or facility. Now, I don't know if this would exactly include a pool, but as we kind of look more holistically at how we're operating kind of our human services or community development aspects of the town, I think there's a lot of opportunities to um, bring the different recreational activities that go on at the library and uh, the recreation department and the senior center closer together, you know, rather than having them so segmented. Um, but honestly, a, a public pool hasn't been brought up yet parkland expansion things like that but never never a pool but it's probably i mean it's probably a way that there'd be some revenue i don't know if the season would be long enough to pay for itself or not they i know in holden uh, they sell season passes and sure. so on or day passes yeah. and it's very very popular yeah I mean, a lot of other towns i know grafton has like a, a public beach um, you know, at Silver Lake, and they do sell passes and things like that to pay for the um, lifeguards and, you know, swimming lessons and things like that. Just as a bit of historical trivia, mm -hmm. back in the mid-70s when Tatasa Beach was still there and the owner was retiring, he offered to sell it to the town for $125,000, I think. Okay. And yeah. the town said, no. <laughs> and, and when that happened, they they talked about how there was a big drop and it wasn't a safe swimming area for public unless you were a swimmer. That it, it was, and I, and I don't know because quite honestly, I used to go to Sunset Beach, not to Tassett, <laughs> so I don't know. I never noticed a big drop. Yeah, that that was always <laughs> the discussion safe. that came up when when that topic was hmm. out there. But just uh, as a matter of, uh, did they have swimming lessons at Tassett? No. No. They Did you all... go to Sunset? I learned on my own. Oh, no. <laughs> but uh, they had all kinds of other uh, things there, and, and just the price alone over the years mm. certainly would have... Well, uh... that's just like we had the Brewer Estate on the foundation property, and the brewers offered for us to, the town, to buy it, mm. and the town didn't want it. Mm -hmm. they, they demolished this beautiful building. When you talk about historical, mm -hmm. um, it was a mansion and mm -hmm. um, it just got demolished because it was not in, it needed a lot of money to uh, repair it and mm -hmm. bring it up to what it should be. And that would have been a beautiful place for, um, it could have been a senior center, it could have been mm -hmm. a recreation area. Um, so that was some another opportunity missed back then. I think you, we now have um, a different mindset because it's the next generation, so we're not as um, conservative with uh, thinking when we think, oh, $125,000 with a lot of money. Uh, you know, I think now we, we actually consider those opportunities. I think that's how we got the Glavin Center, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it, you know, the opportunity was there and the town took it. But we should always have our eyes open for those types of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, and I know this has been so, somewhat of a touchy subject, let's say, uh, the proposed historic preservation bylaw, mm -hmm. if I'm wording it correctly, I know it's changed, is now coming up before the town meeting. Is that mm -hmm. true? It is. We uh, received a letter earlier this week from the petitioner saying that they were going to request for that to be defeated. Um, because uh, I think they're doing the right thing. They've mm -hmm. heard some uh, concerns that were raised in the public that um, at various meetings that, you know, folks were asking for some particular changes and for a little bit more public outreach before they could support it. And um, I'm thankful that the um, proponents uh, for that demolition delay bylaw have 
decided to ask for its defeat and we'll take another look at it and do some more outreach. Um, I actually met with one of the proponents this morning, um, Kevin Samara, you know, to talk about what they're thinking about for next steps. So, um, uh, like I said, I just appreciate the fact that they receive comments from boards, committees, members of the public who said, if you just did these things, we may be able to support it. And, you know, they've decided to slow down and try to make their um, approach even better. So I think they should be commended for that. Yeah. And there's also, um, is a theatrical about the traffic through the historic district. Right. How can that even happen if it's a state highway it's a state hi 140 is a, a state highway right it's a state numbered road the town maintains it but um still a lot of a lot of the verbiage with that's in that article it's a long article um the town doesn't have any authority over it you know things like um diesel truck emissions and things like that the town certainly doesn't have any authority that's right. been reserved at the the state level um you know, there, it is an aged roadway. It's 30-some years old. It's in really good condition, generally speaking, for a 30-year-old roadway. We are challenged on that roadway because there is a lot of heavy truck, tra truck traffic, and that does cause deterioration or, around manholes and things like that. And um, in order to properly address that because of the heavy truck traffic, some you know, it's not as simple as repairing a, a manhole cover on some of the other side streets because it's just much more comprehensive process and you have to let it sit longer, which would cause lane closures for an extended period of time. And just as we're all getting off the roads with our, you know, four wheelers, as the truckers call them, um, the trucks kind of take over in the evening. So that road is, you know, very highly utilized around the clock. So um, I certainly understand the, the residents' concerns there, but there's a lot of aspects of that article that we just don't have authority to be able to control. Some that we do, but some that we don't. And part of that was about sound right. on the climate. I mean, right. what can you do with yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, the, if it's related to something like a manhole cover that's loose and is being hit by vehicles, we can certainly tighten that up and attempt to make those repairs. But <clears throat> general things like, you know, um, not use of Jake brakes and other things like that is um, something that. What's a Jake brake? So I mean, it's I've an, heard it, that word it's, before. It's an engine brake on a truck that you know slows. You know, it, you know, is more than just uh, pressure being applied at the you know at the wheel level. It's you know slowing the engine down itself. It's very loud. Um, it's good to try to prevent that from happening from a noise standpoint but those big vehicles have those for a reason because they need more stopping power and things like that and, i mean there's a whole long discussion about speed and you know general traffic and you know we're we're in an ideally suited location in central massachusetts which is a good thing and a bad thing you know as we try to balance that out if nothing comes of that addressing speed through the center of town which it's impossible to really go fast through the center of town, but there may be times of day where traffic is mm -hmm. faster. You know, that could be, you know, something in, in speed would also help to address um, some of the sound. Mm -hmm. But I don't know who, who would be complaining in the center of town. There's no residents in the mm -hmm. center of town. And then you pass through the cemetery, so I don't think anybody there is complaining. Not yet. Not yet, anyhow. So... Um, <laughs> But, you know, maybe speed would be, of, of anything, something that could come of mm -hmm. it. One thing, it's just something I heard about, and I'm not sure it's, it's coming to pass, uh, was mention of some type of uh, wharf or fishing dock mm -hmm. at Jordan Pond. That's right. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, so that is planned, and, you know, we've done a lot of work on that. It's state assistance um, will, will come to be, and... Um, be accessible and all those things. So it'll be a, a good asset. You know, it's being managed through the uh, Parks Commission. Uh, they were in to Selectman, I can't remember now, in late summer, early fall. Um, state support behind it. And I'm not exactly sure the timing on it, but I think it has all its approval. Which to... part of Jordan Pond would they put that on? I'm not exactly sure, to oh, be honest. From what I'm understand where the walking trail is the paved yeah. walking trail over in on the west side the of the Coolidge school side yes yeah there's a spot over there that's fairly flat mm -hmm. 
uh, where people do fish now, but yeah. you have to stand on the banking or whatever. That, that might be something nice. Yes, yeah, the state incentivizes those programs because when people walk along the edge of the, the pond and fish from the edge of the pond, it actually degrades the pond, you know, the, the banks and causes sediment to run off and things like that. So they try to put in those stable structures um, to keep the health of the water. And banks. So who, who would be involved with the planning of that? Would it be strictly the state or would like recreation? No, the Parks, Parks, Com Parks yeah, Commission. Yeah, Parks Commission. Because it'd be nice if they did do something like that, that they put benches on that water, mm. you know, mm. so that it, mm -hmm. it, it's useful in multiple ways. Right. Now, what a nice idea. Mm. Whoever thought yes, of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Graduation is going to be at the Senior Center, uh, the Senior Center, mm. the DCU Center this year? Yes, it is. Yep. Is that expensive or did the town get a bargain on that? Well, I, I don't know what the price tag is, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know that we They need the space. Yeah, they need the space is the bottom line to yeah. be able to accommodate it. And it's awful competitive this time of year to have a venue. Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head um, what the price is. Now, graduation would be at Mechanics Hall. And Mechanics mm -hmm. Hall is probably similar cost, so it may not really be yeah. that much of a difference from one place to the other, but good that they're getting a place with, I, I would assume, the parking's better and, and um, you can have more seats for family members because trying to jam all the graduates and their families into the gym, I think... Uh, became burdensome just because you couldn't even get tickets for your relatives. You know, everybody has to see that kid graduating. So, are you familiar with the State Medal of Liberty program? I'm not. Okay, like here that. two or three years ago now, the state came out with the Medal of Liberty. It's very similar. It looks very similar to a Purple Heart medal. Oh. And it's made for the next of kin of anyone who was killed in action, died of wounds, uh, died as a prisoner, things like that. Um, and what we're doing is trying to get out to various cities and towns to get someone in the city or town interested in uh, administering that. So uh, here in Shrewsbury, we've come up with a list of probably maybe a dozen from World War II forward. We had one in Korea, one in Vietnam, one in the current era who's already, the family's already gotten the medal, from what I understand. So there's not a ton of them, but it does require some work, number one, to locate the next of kin, mm -hmm. uh, which can be challenging. But the, the one instance that's come up lately was there was no next of kin living. Oh. Um, I, I believe this person grew up in a foster home, mm. for instance. So the, the town, I think it may be Sutton, has agreed to accept the medal on behalf of the deceased service member and display it prominently in the a town building, town hall or whatever, until such time as uh, any family member comes forward to claim it type thing. Would that be something if we ran into that? Without a well, doubt, I know that, you know, Speaking for the board of selectmen, which I rarely do, would 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 absolutely <laughs> That's a safe one. yeah would absolutely support that. And yeah, yeah. We certainly have nice prominent areas within this building that that we would find a home if that would ever come up for the town. Yeah. Uh, we've done some preliminary uh, looking around, and we've identified through either myself or I have somebody on my staff that's kind of taken this on as. Mm -hmm. Uh, nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. He's really, really diligent about it uh, in my other mm -hmm. job. And uh, he gets in there and really does uh, genealogical research to try and find the descendants and so on as, as far away as California and everywhere else. But uh, we've already identified probably three or four of the families out of the dozen where we know who the next of kin is. Some are still, you know, local and things like that. So. Mike, did you say that that was three families within Shrewsbury who had uh, service members killed in action? There's probably about a dozen, from okay. what I remember. Mostly World War II. Okay. No, there, there was one in Korea, which I know who the descendants mm -hmm. are there. Uh, one in Vietnam, we know descendants there. Uh, the current era one was Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and his mother 
uh, already had applied for it. Mm -hmm. She doesn't live in town, I don't uh, think, but okay. he, I was, he didn't grow up here. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that one of the articles on the town meeting is for the Gold Star parents um, to have the property tax uh, abated yeah, at 100%. Uh, for any, um, you know, parents whose child was was killed in action. And, you know, we, we've had some of those conversations um, in our various hearings related to the town meeting warrant, and folks, you know, have, I think, rightfully pointed out and said, well, why is it just parents? Why isn't it any, you know, a, a spouse or something? You know, why wouldn't they be eligible? But that's just because that's what the, the state law has allowed us to exempt. Um, it's nothing to do with, we're just accepting a state law through this, um, we're not able to do any property tax exemptions without state law because that's reserved for the state's authority. So um, that's interesting. There are state tax exemptions, aren't there, for disabled veterans? Uh, I believe it's based on the percentage of disability through yeah. the VA. Yeah. And we had somebody come in today. Uh, not only is there uh, exemptions for property tax, but also excise tax on one vehicle type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe uh, license renewal fees are waived. There's a number of different things uh, they can uh, apply for. I think it's a good idea, so I don't want anyone to misinterpret my question. But my question and would be, how clearly is the definition for the per person or family where this would be eligible? Because when you think of all the, um, what would you call it, the post-traumatic stress. Okay, that has been brought up at the state level. Mm -hmm. uh, General Keith, who's our adjutant general, has, has been involved in meetings at the state level about that. And basically what they came up with is the law was written this way to mirror the uh, requirements for a Purple Hat mm -hmm. on active duty. And anything other than that, post-traumatic stress, if they were, say, 100% service-connected disability through the VA and then pass away, uh, die, say, from wounds received, but 20 years later, it, it doesn't meet the criteria of right. the law as written. Uh, the advice was, if you think that's something uh, that should be addressed, you need to file an amendment or file a new law. So that's right. where we stand with that. And that's not to be opposed to mm -hmm. any of the opinion. I, I just happen to think there's so many veterans with post-traumatic stress that that is a big, and it's not always clearly defined. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it comes up in um, not always obvious ways, I right. guess. So I, I just think that that would be a difficult decision Mm. It, when someone has to make that determination. Yes, you know, it's been somewhat of a stumbling block, but yeah. they have to go by whatever the, however the law is written, yeah. as I understand it. So, marijuana, are we getting the revenue from that, or are we just going to talk about it for another year? <laughs> not yet. So the, the, the two facilities are not open in, in town yet. We're getting awful close, actually, a lot closer each month with both of them. The facility... Um, under the name of the botanists at 235 Hartford Turnpike. They were in, in front of the Board of Selectmen a few meetings ago, and um, they affirmed their commitment to their prior name entity, which, which signed it with some different um, leadership at the table. So they've affirmed that, and we're just going to process a letter through documenting that affirmation. Uh, they have one final, one or two final steps at the um, Cannabis Control Commission, and then some local approvals um, related to um, on-site approvals with the town before they would be, be able to be opened. And then um, the uh, second one who came to the board under the name of Pharmacanus that will actually open under their retail name, Verilife, they will be, for the, will be before the planning board um, this July. So... Um, they're not going to make any physical improvements um, to, to the footprint of their building on site. They'll just make interior improvements. Um, and, you know, then they'll still have to go through their full final process for the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, so both a work in progress. And does the town have to get involved with CBD oil and CBD cream where it's sold everywhere? And I've seen it even mm -hmm. at gas stations. Mm -hmm. Does the town have to get involved with 
the regulations around that, or are there no regulations? Or? Yeah, we're, I'm not 100% sure what the regulations are, but it's not under the same categorization because as Because the there's no hallucinogens yeah. and yep. it's no THC, right. so um, I was just curious if the town had to be involved with the le legitimizing what's legitimate yep. and not the ones that come up as um, not to phony. My, not to my knowledge. I know that if we have any control over that, which I assume that we don't because we, we don't have any other licenses you know, related to all those different establishments that it could be sold in, whether it's a gas station or otherwise, it would come through the, the Board of Health. But again, I, I do not believe that we have any um, regulatory aspect over that. Is there any uh, priority given to now we're working on replacing the Beale School, uh, so on and so forth, to what public buildings, a sequence, mm -hmm. where they fall and, you know, a possible a good replacement? Question. Yeah. Um, so near-term wise, you know, along with the Beale project that's ongoing, we will be looking at primarily the police station is next. Um, there was actually a comprehensive architectural review done of all town buildings, not necessarily for replacement, but for identification of capital improvements, but not full scale renovations or replacements. Um, a couple of years ago through an architectural firm that the public facilities division kind of uses as their guidebook as they're building uh, annual preventative maintenance and improvements at those buildings. Um, through word of mouth, I guess nothing else. The police station is kind of next. You know, we know that it's, you know, an early 1970s building that did have some renovations about 20 years ago. Um, you know, but over, you know, that, you know, 40 year period of time plus the, the um, size of the force and the population and the requirements of the police department have definitely outgrown um, what that building footprint, at least as it sits right now, can handle. So that's what we're going to focus on this summer. And along at the same time, we're just trying to be efficient with the use of dollars. Since we're going to have consultants in looking at that building, we're also going to take a kind of a space and programmatic review of the town hall and the senior center, you know, kind of co-located on the municipal campus. And that those projects aren't intended to do, you know, radical replacements of those buildings, but, you know, they're both aging um, senior center was built in 1999 without any you know major renovation since that time so it's time to take a look at it and see what has changed and what we need to be considering in the future um, in the town hall although we renovated the second floor within the last few years um, there haven't been any major renovations or expansions to this building since again the mid 90s when Selco actually built this wing onto the building so um, we're going to take a look at those two buildings as well. I mean, there's certain. I, I don't think we'll we'll never get to the end of the list because when you get to the end, you'll go back to the beginning, um, as far as buildings go. Um, but we know other things that are out there, like our um, lesser known water and sewer garage and highway garage at South Street is um, certainly um, on the list of something that we need to address from a, you know, a workplace safety standpoint and a, just a general um, maintenance and, and workspace configuration standpoint. I don't know if anyone knows when those buildings were built on South Street, but you know, they're very simple metal buildings that we have folks working in day in, day out, and you know, they're not as, as accommodating as they could be, um, and they're, they're getting rather old. So it's something that's on the list, not you know next year but so going back to the police station and i've heard through the grapevine words like municipal campus mm -hmm. so the municipal campus plan although i believe there is work that needs to be done mm -hmm. um, that won't interfere or slow down what needs to be done on the police station will it that's right no the priority the clear priority is the police station um and we would, in my mind, whatever needs to be done at the police station is the first priority. And if we can identify things that need to be done that make sense to save money, you know, if it's gonna, if we're gonna do 
other renovations that cost five hundred thousand dollars that would otherwise cost seven hundred fifty thousand dollars because we did it alone and we'd have to pay mobilization well then maybe we would consider that but i would never want to put the police station project in jeopardy for those other not lesser needed but not as prioritized um, projects mm -hmm. um, as I, it relates to the police station i think that's really nice and i think it's important for the public to know that and um, given our age, I just want you to do a really good job on the senior center. <laughs> but um, no, all kidding aside, um, I, I do believe that looking at big pictures are important. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wouldn't want to see the police station project slowed down, mm -hmm. um, un, for unnecess not unnecessary, but unreasonably, when that really mm -hmm. has a, more of a sense of urgency, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, we're really just trying to be as, as not creative as possible, but as... as smart as possible with, you know, if we're going to sign a contract for an architect, you know, to do, let's just say the review of this building in and of itself um, versus them being able to also send their people through here when they're going through the police station and really spending a lot of time there, we, we, we just think there'll be a lot of savings versus doing separate mm -hmm. standalone stovepipe so projects. So it's good planning. Hopefully. Michael's father was a firefighter. Okay. My father was a part-time firefighter, and I just found out that my great-grandfather was a firefighter in Worcester, which I didn't know. Uh -huh. See, now, Michael would have known that being a historian, but I didn't. I just found that out. Um, but I understand that the firefighters aren't happy with um, staffing. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with that? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's part of a, an ongoing dialogue that, Everyone recognizes that, uh, when I say everyone, you know, myself, the fire chief, um, board of selectmen, and the union, the firefighters union, and a lot of residents just recognize that, yeah, we have grown and... and Excuse me, and your son, right? Oh, he's a police he's officer. Police officer, so I'm mixing yeah. up, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the town has grown and the the staffing levels in the fire department outside of the addition of the deputy chief in in recent years hasn't grown and but i think all those folks including the residents that i mentioned recognize that we do need to to um take some action and and we definitely need four additional firefighters um the board of selectmen uh we had a conversation the other night um and through the town manager's report um you know, kind of reconfirm that right now we have a safer grant into the federal government and that grant would provide funding on a declining basis for four, the four additional firefighters. And by declining, you mean the town would ultimately take on yeah, the full cost? Yeah, take on the full cost over, um, you know, a three-year period. But if that doesn't come through, and that's been our sole approach over the past four years, just look at the grant. If the grant doesn't come through, we didn't have any other actions. But this year, the Board of Selectmen said, if the grant doesn't come through, we've got to take some local action. And, um, you know, that could be, you know, funding a, a firefighter as soon as this fall, if we know that um, the grant isn't successful. The challenge that we have with the firefighters is in order to um, impact the staffing levels because of the three station configuration um, and the groups, and the, the way they're yeah, grouped, the way they're grouped, which they're, means the shift, a, a group works a shift and another group works the next yep. shift. And so you have multiple stations and multiple groups, multiple groups and 24 so, hour shifts. So to be effective in seven days a week. So mm -hmm. to be effective, you need how many? Four to mm -hmm. basically provide one additional firefighter per shift per station, you know, on every, um, you know, every shift there. So. You know, and the other thing is, is, you know, are we are we operating as efficiently as we can with all the other firefighters? So we we separately dispatch um, police and fire services. So if a 911 call comes in for a structure fire, it comes into the police station, but it's transferred over for that technical expert to be able to manage the equipment and dispatch the, the right station, the right um, type of equipment based on that incident. And we use a firefighter for that right now. And if we are able to train civilian dispatchers, you know, at some point in the future, that would free up a firefighter that we could have out on a truck, which, you know, which, which is what everyone wants to do. We want to have three firefighters on every truck because of the safety and the importance and the effectiveness once they get on the scene. So I think we're all working to that end. Um, you know, the fire um, 
fighters union has put out you know a letter and everything to town meeting we've had a lot of great conversations since that letter have gone out and kind of reaffirmed and made sure everyone was aware of my position um and the board of selections selectmen's position and the mutual interest to get those firefighter levels up um and we'll continue to work at it and uh, it's challenging though be um you know the with having to hire the four firefighters it's you know over three hundred twenty thousand dollars if we were just to say okay let's do that and um, a number like that is, you know, it's a significant portion, you know, 30% of all of our new revenue in any single year. Very worthwhile and very important to do, and we're going to figure out how to do that. So in each station right now per shift is how many men? So at the outlying stations, two and three, there's two. Two. Yes. And they always must run with two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I feel like I'm part of the histor history here, but... Um, that may sound really low to people, but people have no idea how hot it was to get the Edgemere station, mm -hmm. which no longer is the Edgemere station, but to get the Edgemere station staffed with two minimum because they used to have a firefighter in there by himself. Mm. And he would actually go to a fire. And that wasn't that long ago. No. He would go to a fire mm. by himself. Wow. And, it, and however time it took for the other... Yeah. trucks to get there from um, other parts of town. So if there was a building fire, mm -hmm. that person was by himself. Mm -hmm. So we made it to two. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to keep going, to keep building. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the fortunate event is, is across all those stations, if we know it's a, you know, fire showing, smoke showing, we can get you know, other trucks, other people, other equipment through other means, you know, with, with the, you know, five other on five other firefighters on staff and then, you know, other firefighters living in town and, you know, we have a working structure fire, everyone gets called in regardless. So and then mutual that's not aid. ideal. Yeah. yeah I mean, and, and none of it's ideal because yep. you do want to ha staff it as best Ourselves. you can. Yep. Yeah. So um, I, I just find it interesting by coincidence the nature of um, what our family's occupations were over mm -hmm. the years, mm -hmm. which is really just a fluke. But um, And then the police also need to be focused on their staffing. Yep, so the, the, there's one additional patrol officer in the fiscal year 20 budget, which will start this July. And for my conversations from the outset uh, with the chief, this is part of the incremental increase of staffing by four, you know, from five years ago now. So... Um, that's kind of where we see the equilibrium right now based on call volume, staffing requirements for their shifts, um, and the ability to house folks at the current station. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where we are, uh, at least at this point, with, with policing. Do you have any other questions? I do not. Okay. So have you been I, um, notified by public health? that we have any incidences of measles in town? Not within town. I know um, we saw today that there's a height, heightened awareness in Worcester. Um, we are fortunate to share in the resources of Central Mass Regional Public Health Alliance, which means we have the full resources of, of the city of Worcester and collaborate with you know six other communities in addition to the city. So uh, we're working at that collaboratively and it's, you know, it's something that um, I know I actually had a meeting this afternoon with the public health director, Karen Clark, that she wasn't able to attend because she needed to focus on that um, particular matter. I noticed, in, we're running short on time, mm -hmm. but I noticed in the, in the um, town meeting articles, you have articles 14, 15, 16, and 17, and they're titled sewer capital, water capital, storm water capital, and general capital. Mm -hmm. You have an awful lot of capital needs. Yep. You always did. Yeah, we used Now to, you're just categorizing yeah, it? Yeah, we used to do it differently. We actually used to do individual projects in water and sewer by themselves. So we used to have a, a, a one article that did water main replacements, one article that did sewer replacements, another did a that did I you know inflow and infiltration for sewer another that did equipment for the water department so we really just said okay what's what's sewer let's do it all in one article what's water do it all in one article and we you know we are changing to enterprise funds for water uh, and establishing one for stormwater so that makes it just a little easier and I think that folks can get their arms around numbers because we'll present a single balance sheet for all those utilities versus kind of dribs and drabs of individual projects. I think it's a it's a more of a holistic, we're, 
we'll be willing to answer any detailed questions about any single aspect of any one of those uh, capital plans, but I think having them all on the same page and showing how they're all funded from one source is, is a little clearer. Well, Michael, I'd like to thank you for being here. Yeah, I always you. find your questions very interesting um, from that historical perspective, and, and you, you bring some good points to uh, the town manager. So I'd like to just say thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.